Welcome back to the anti meta Meta Club. This week's race C is another group four race with a mandatory stop and no mandatory tire compound. So it's really all about just when you pit. Luckily, the bop is actually kind of balanced right now. So there are a few cars I'd consider meta and one really strong anti meta contender. Let's get into it. Once again, the anti meta car is the Jag. Like most of the anti meta cars, it's a great all arounder, but it isn't quite as fast or as nimble as some of the other cars. It doesn't have that straight line power like the Aston does, but unlike the Aston, it has pretty good tire wear, so it is capable in a fight. I managed to put the Jag in 30th place as of last night with a 45.1, but 44s are definitely possible with this. You can see by Lester's time and James's time that they're very close. It's definitely possible to get a 44 in this, even maybe a mid-high 44. But anyways, there's lots of cars in the top 100. The V8 Vantage, 650, and Supra are all what I would consider the meta car. Here's the tune that I used, and a special note, I did use plus 5 brake balance as well as weak ABS. Make sure you put this tune on every single time you enter the race. Default ABS should also work with this, so don't be afraid to try. As you start your lap, make sure you start really early turning in towards the kink. It's not even really a corner, so if you wait really late and then late apex this, like I see a lot of people do, it's just going to waste time. You could even start in the middle of the track. Your first braking point is about a car length before the start of the curbing here on the right. I like to aim so I put my tires just barely on the flat part of the curb, but you'll notice it gets higher towards the outside of it. You want to avoid that part. You're going to want to brake heavily getting all the way down to second gear and turning in before the end of the red part on the right where the grass starts. You want to make sure you keep up a lot of speed. I actually like to get back on the throttle in between these two corners and I aim for about right here. Instead of setting up super wide, since it's uphill, you want to keep as much momentum as you can, just barely lifting as much as you need to to get your right tires all the way up on the lip of the curb and then gently get back on the throttle. If you get any oversteer, you've got to immediately fix that. You should be using that curb, so make sure you come off of it before you get to the grass. This next corner should be taken flat, and there's not a lot of really good stuff to look at to know exactly when you want to turn in, but you can see these tiny little marks that I'm going to illustrate here on the ground. I like to turn in before this line that kind of cuts across towards the apex. You do not need to lift, but if you're going to understeer past, then definitely lift to save yourself from going off the track. And if you're tempted to go over and straddle the high part of the curb, I would suggest not doing that because it is kind of RNG. To maximize this corner, you have to put your left tires all the way up on the lip of the curb, but that can be really tricky. You can instead avoid that lip entirely and just have to deal with having a little bit less track to use, but it can be super sketchy if you're not perfectly aligned with the lip of the curb when you're riding on top of it. Right when the grass ends is about when you want to hit the brakes. You can see that it shows that I'm using a little bit of brake before, but that's just because I was driving like a weirdo. So ignore that. You want to brake right at the end of the grass. I found if I use 100% brake and start turning in while still holding 100% brake right at the beginning of the red ground on the left, then I can start trail braking after I get all the way on the flat ground and then back on the throttle super early because it's important to keep as much speed through there as possible. It's also important not to start trail braking before you come off the curb because it can really upset the balance of the car. As you go over this blind crest, you want to start turning in just as you go over it, go over this little bit of curb and then prepare for this next turn. Once you get past this orange part of the barrier on the right, you're going to lift, turn in, and then add brakes very gently after you've turned in, which should slow your car down and allow you to tuck the nose in towards the apex on the left. Continue adding steering as you're coming off the brakes, and then add a lot more after you're completely off the brakes. As you hit the apex, get back on the throttle while still steering to the left, continually steering until we get to this orange part of the barrier here on the left. Notice that I'm actually to the right of the middle of the track. You're going to notice that I can actually stay entirely full throttle using the upshift as I apex on this right hander to tuck the nose in just a little bit. And as long as I don't steer too hard or too quickly, you can change the direction of the car by transferring the weight really gently. If you turn too quickly, you're going to find yourself understeering and the car is not going to respond. So being really gentle with your steering here is what can make you keep a lot of speed and allow the car to turn a lot better than if you're really, really quick on the steering. Keep in mind when judging where to brake that you are going downhill after a very high speed section. So it's going to take a little bit longer than usual. When your nose gets all the way past this part of the curb, that's when you want to hit the brakes. And again, you don't want to go on the high part of the curb if you use the curb at all. You can actually completely avoid it here and you'll still have really good turn in and a really good line. Turn in at the 50, making sure you're in second gear and you're using a lot of brake pressure as you get all the way to the apex and then get back on that throttle. You're going to be going really slow here, so it's going to be easy to oversteer or understeer. Be very gentle and be very careful with your steering inputs. If you feel like you're oversteering, correct it really quickly. The approach to the death chicane is just as important as how you navigate straight through it. So when I go over this first corner, I like to turn in so much that I actually completely miss the next curb. 
The main key to navigating the death chicane is to transfer the weight just a single time and hold the car in that position until you're all the way through. As you can see right here, the car is leaning to the right. I'm also lifting off the throttle a little bit to avoid this outside wall. That's the very best way, in my opinion, to approach this. If you aim so that if you understeer, you'll hit the wall, you can then keep the same steering angle and just gently lift off the throttle to fix your line. Treating it like a single corner allows you to fix any kind of mistakes from this setup while you're in the middle of the corner. As you can see from here, it doesn't quite look like I'm gonna make it. It feels like I'm understeering, which is perfect because if I'm understeering, again, to tighten up the line, if I add a little bit more steering and or lift off the throttle, it should just tighten up the line. If we get to a point where I flatten the car out and stop transferring the weight on the side, then it's gonna take a long time to then transfer the weight to the side again, and that's gonna make it so we can't be quite as precise and accurate going through the hard part of the chicane. Once I go over the penultimate curve of the chicane, I can tell that I do indeed have the right line. It's here that I need to get back on the throttle and then change the direction of the car before I get to the next curb. You want to load up the left side of the car as you go over the curb so that you can maintain that same load after you get off the curb and then you'll be able to avoid that wall. If you have the weight transfer the wrong direction or if it's just neutral, then it's going to take a lot of time for that weight to shift so that you can then avoid that exit wall. So make sure you change directions before you get to that next curb. As you get over the curb right here, you can see that I have indeed changed the directions before I hit it. So as soon as we get over the curb and the bouncing stops, I can resume normal steering. It is possible to take that with this tune and with many of the other cars completely flat, but that requires a perfect setup. And when you're trying to get the same lap over and over again, it's sometimes not even worth it. So I like to err on the side of understeer so I can fix it with a little bit of throttle. For the final braking zone, I like to brake just about a car length before the last part of curbing that we see here on the left. Go full brake and as soon as your entire car gets past the beginning of the curbing, then you're going to start turning in still on full brake until you're about at third gear. We're going to continue decelerating and trail braking into second gear trying to hit a very late apex, but pop it back up to third gear for the exit. Be gentle on the throttle, but you should be able to get on that throttle and stay on it all the way to the end of the lap. Like all the curbs, it can be really dangerous, so if you're sliding whatsoever or if you have too much steering angle when you go up on this curb right here, it can easily make you spin. Some choose to straddle that last little bit of curbing, but if you hit it weird, it can completely upset your car and make you lose a lot of momentum. Like I mentioned in the breakdown, you can actually start like from the middle of the track and just cut in when you get to this first kind of corner because it's not really a real corner. A big mistake a lot of people make here is slowing down way too much for this. You're going to have more front grip than you might imagine. As long as you hit the right line, then you're going to be able to just lift for the right hander and carry a lot of speed. Since it is uphill, you will have more grip in the front than you expect. This right hand corner is going to be all about timing and feel, but you can definitely do it without lifting just like I did right there. And of course, like I mentioned before, if you're going to use that really high part of the curb, make sure you're really careful about your brakes. And I'd stay hard on the brakes as you come off of it too, to make sure you've got full control. It's important to sacrifice this first corner, this left hander more so than the rest, because you've got to make sure that you're getting on the throttle and staying on the throttle as early as possible, because it is a full throttle section. Consider it like it's a straightaway, but of course there's curbs. And since it's uphill, if you lose momentum, it's really hard to get it back or you just won't get it back. So sacrifice the first corner so you can carry a lot of speed through the second two. When you're learning this track, there's a chance that you're going to end up with wildly different speeds coming out of this tight right hander. And that's going to make the death chicane handle a lot differently, depending on how fast you're going. Of course, when you're used to it, you're going to be hitting a normal, like a, like a relatively similar speed. But be careful of your speed as you're going through here, because a few miles per hour different can make a huge difference when it comes to going through the death chicane. And for the final corner, make sure that you're braking heavily. Don't let yourself slide past the apex. A lot of people don't pay as much attention to the apex here. I see a lot of people just completely slide past it and then just hope that they are able to get on the throttle early enough. Be disciplined with that last corner. You do have to scrub a lot of speed off, so just be very patient with coming off the brakes. And straddle the last kink at your own risk. PD has been accused of sometimes being not very creative with their races. And unfortunately, this is one of the reasons why. I can't even recall how many times I've had to give out the exact same strategy advice because all of these races have been the same. This is actually something that they started in GT Sport and two years later, they're using the exact same formula for the vast majority of the group four races. A single pit stop is required, but your pace doesn't get bad enough to really justify taking tires because it does take an extra few seconds. That means the ultimate goal of your strategy should be to go into the pits when no one else does. 
While you can't really determine if people behind you are going to follow you into the pits, you can choose to follow the people in front of you really closely, seeing if they're going to go in the pits, and of course choose not to actually dive into the pits if they do. Your starting position on track will also determine where you're going to pit and also what people around you are going to do. If you're starting towards the front, most likely people will not be pitting right off the bat. Not only are they the fastest people based on qualification, they also don't want to just run into the back of the train of traffic. Conversely, if you're starting in the back deliberately, or if you have set a time that isn't quite up to the standard that you know you can hit in race, and you've got people in front of you who you think will slow you down, the very best bet would be to pit as early as you possibly can. The pit here is really difficult to get into without making a very deliberate line into it, however, so if you end up trying to go in the pits and then cancel at the end, you're still going to lose a little bit of time. One thing you can also do is just follow the people that are close to you at the very beginning of the race. There's a chance that people directly in front of you are only going to be going slower than you are just because there's a train of people ahead. So unless you really know what people's pace are in front of you, then you might want to hold off on making your decision for a lap or two. It's probably not going to make that much of a difference if you end up in traffic just for the first couple laps, because even if you choose your pit timing carefully, you may end up next to someone when you come out based on their pace when they're alone as well. So. All in all, there is just a lot of chance to it, but what you can do is try to go out of your way to make sure you're not going to the pits when anyone else is. There's also a lot of people trying to pass in the death chicane. The death chicane is hard enough on its own. Just by yourself, it's hard enough to navigate. So if someone is really fighting tooth and nail to try to go in two at a time with you, I would suggest just letting them go because the section directly afterwards is a long straight followed by another long straight. There's a good chance you're going to be in a better position just following them than they are leading. I mentioned this earlier, but I should mention again that I did use weak ABS and plus five brake balance for this race, as well as the time trial. I wasn't entirely sure, but I thought Velocin might be going into the pits. When it turned out he wasn't, I immediately decided to go in, and luckily the only other people going in the pits were two to three seconds ahead of me. You really want to just focus on maximizing the amount of clean air that you have. Now, if Velasa and the other car that were really close to me end up going to the pits on the next lap, then the lap after that, we might end up together if we have very similar pace because we are going to have clean air. With the other people going in the pits up ahead, they're at least a few seconds ahead. Yeah, it looks like 2.5 seconds ahead looking at the split right there. So they weren't going to be any kind of an issue for quite some time. I would have to catch up a second and a half before I started feeling either their slip or their dirty air. Fast forward the end of two laps later, we've almost caught up to someone who hadn't gone in the pits yet. So we know that's automatically one position we're gaining. Now that I'm finally about a second behind the two people we've been chasing, that means that I'm going to start getting the slipstream, but it also means I'm going to start getting dirty air. So you've got to be really considerate of how that's going to affect your handling. Getting the fastest lap, despite the fact that the fastest lap is pretty slow, it definitely means that our strategy has been working. And as we end up passing our friend race pace right there, we take another position. Also, I almost lost it right there, but luckily race pace has good control and we didn't collide. Thank you, race pace. Two laps later, lap seven, I have now finally caught up to the two guys that I've been chasing since lap two. When two people battle, it is sometimes an opportunity to follow the correct one and end up taking one or both of their positions because of their battling. However, if someone's battling you and you make the wrong decision, you might end up losing that position that you were trying to gain. I was initially upset thinking that the red NSX had braked too early, but in reality he did absolutely nothing wrong and I just was not paying attention, so that was just a skill issue on my part, ending up losing that position like that. And Nissan GTR R30, you did nothing wrong there. I'm sorry if you were listening when I was upset. That was my bad. Now with all that said, luckily, we still had three laps after this one, and of course there's a death chicane on every one of those laps, so I hadn't quite given up just yet. These high speed S's can be pretty difficult on their own, but of course when you're trying to pass people on them or if you're just trying to stay close even, it can be really easy to misjudge it and go off in the gravel. It's actually really good that Velocity was able to hold it straight. Most cars that go off there end up spinning. With that one tiny mistake, I was able to take advantage and then get back in the position I was just a few laps before so I can once again try to pass both of these guys in front of me. On the final lap, I was once again in position to try to make a move and their positions had changed. On top of that, since it's the final lap, you know both of them are going to be really going for that one first place position. Going too wide on any complicated corner is pretty much an invitation for the person behind to pass and so I took my chances with a very inside line and luckily I was able to get all the way next to the NSX. 
No matter how hard I'm fighting, I'm always going to give space. And I love the fact that he trusted me too. He went in full bore too, but I was just ahead enough and I had a better line. So I was able to get all the way in front at that point. I don't think I had even consciously realized it at this point, but our friend Grumpy Pants is someone on my list of people I am not embarrassed to lose to. He's a very fast driver. I'm 100% not trying to make excuses for myself because you can see by the lines he's taking, he's actually just driving a lot better than I am, but that Supra is what I consider the meta car. So I thought this was going to be the perfect opportunity to showcase what the Jag can do. Let me redact that last statement. It is a perfect showcase of what the Jag can do because right here, it almost looks like we're on even machinery. Like I pointed out before, he's also taking better lines than I am. He's hitting all his apexes. He's carrying a lot of speed through it. He's using all of the track and all I can do is try to hang on and look for an opportunity. I was hoping that I'd be able to nail the death chicane and he wouldn't quite be able to nail it. But of course, last lap, last attempt, he absolutely nailed it. I was able to stick with him, but he carried a lot of speed through and there just wasn't enough space for me to get all the way next, up next to him. Now I positioned myself as if I was going to go for a pass just in case he made a mistake and then I could dip in the inside. That comes with the risk of not being able to carry as much speed through and because he didn't make a mistake I was able to only get a little bit closer leading us to this drag. He used that super super dangerous line and I couldn't quite pull it off but it was a really really good race. Shout out to both Grumpy Pants and Nissan GTR R30. That was a fantastic race. I actually really, really enjoyed that one. Despite my initial complaints, it was a really good race. And I am very glad that I was able to get that kind of result with the F-Type. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked what you saw, please don't forget to like and subscribe. And of course, I'll be making another one of these guides every single week. To finish off, we're going to give a shout out to all of my members. I love every one of you. Thank you very much.